G'day again everyone, welcome back to the vlog. We're currently on day two of the Gold Coast trip and I'm about to play my first tournament. It's gonna to be a six max shot clock format for a 666 buy-in. So I take that as a very good omen that I'm gonna start running good on this trip. Definitely didn't run that well last night when I hopped into my first cash session. But like I've talked about on this vlog before, when I'm playing in a new room for the first time or even the first time in a while, there definitely is more nerves there and I do find it harder to play my A game. So I'm really gonna anticipate pay that during this tournament because I haven't played in this building before that we're about to go to so don't think I'll quite be on my A game but going to try my best to do so anyway the tournament starts in about an hour and I've got to catch a half an hour Uber trip over there in sort of peak hour Gold Coast traffic so don't want to waste any more time let's get into these cars So we arrive at South Pork Sharks and it's actually really beautiful. They even have two aquariums there, which is super, super cool. Check out some fish before I get to play some poker with some fish, if you know what I'm saying. We go to sign up for the tournament when we're there and it actually turns out to be a pretty colossal pain in the ass. Not only were the waiting lines to get in the game really, really long, but you had to download a mobile app to even sign up for the tournament. But there were so many people trying to download the app at once that the whole thing crashed. And then when I finally did get to the front of the line, I paid to get my tournament ticket and then they just gave me a receipt and the receipt didn't say like where to go or anything so they're like okay you have to go and talk to this person I go and talk to that person they're like oh you have to go and talk to this person and then when I go to the third person they tell me to speak to the second person so it was a bit of a hassle and it took me probably like half an hour to get everything sorted honestly it was taking so long I probably would have left if I hadn't already paid the money up front which I did when I was at the front of the line but after half an hour we did get into the six max tournament that's where we played this first hand we're at the 200-400 level and I open King Jack offsuit for 1k. Then I get a call from a tight aggressive small blind. So we go heads up to a flop, ace, eight, five, rainbow. The small blind checks it over to me and pretty interesting decision with what I want to do with the King Jack here. Definitely some merit to just having a range bet on an ace high board when I did open MP. But considering that it's a tight aggressive player calling in the small blind, I actually think they're going to have a more condensed range of hands. We'll be calling a lot on this board. I think they have all of the ace jack offsuit, ace 10 offsuit suit combinations but it's not like they have a lack of hands that can cool down on a board that's this good for them so I do decide to check back but definitely do think there is some merit to having a range bet so we get a free turn which is the five of diamonds putting out backdoor diamonds the opponent checks it over to me again and I think in this spot just trying to get to showdown with king high makes a lot of sense I do expect to lose to a lot of the pocket pairs in my opponent's range but they could also have something like jack 10 10 9 suited that we're ahead of so we're trying to take our showdown value at this point I check it back and then we're off to the river, which is the king of clubs. Pretty good river. We do make a pair when the opponent checks it over to me. Definitely want to go for a bit of a thin value here. I really do expect my opponent to have a lot of those like weaker pock pairs, sevens, sixes, tens, and I think I can get paid off. So I go ahead and make it 1000 and the opponent tanks a little bit before throwing in the call. I show my king jack and they end up mucking their hand. It's a pretty hot start to get this tournament going. So a few levels on at this point and haven't really had any interesting hands or really any playable hands at this point. So we have chipped down a significant amount. We're down to 22K at this point at the 400, 800 with a 400 big blind anti level. And then I'm in middle position with pocket eights. I go ahead and open it up to 2K. Then the action folds to a tight aggressive player on the button and they go ahead and three bet it to 6.1K. The action folds back around to me and I thought this was a really sick spot. Like we are playing what is like deep stacked 
for a tournament. But like you guys know me, I'm a cash game player. I'm used to being, you know, 100 or 200 big blinds effective. And I do think if we were 100 or 200 big blinds effective, there would be a lot of merit to just calling, trying to hit a set and protect our opening range. When we're only like 27-ish big blinds effective, I really hate doing that, particularly when my opponent did use a larger three bet size in position. I just think calling out a position to try and hit a set will be pretty disastrous long-term for us. So I really do take calling off of the table straight away. My options become between four betting and folding. Really don't want to go ahead and four bet with this hand. I think any four bet sizing I use will just commit all of my 27 big blinds to the all in. And if I do go all in with this hand, like I'm probably not going to get called by a worse hand. So that leaves me with the one option left that isn't like absolutely awful. I just decide to fold my pocket eights. Admittedly, I'm a noob at tournaments, but I really do think like getting that much in pre-flop would be a mistake. But then I talked to a mate of mine who is actually good at tournaments, unlike myself, and they said that getting it all in with eights there wouldn't be that bad actually. So maybe I did make a bit of a mistake by folding my eights there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So the chip down had really started to kill me at this point. In fact, we were down to the 600, 1200, 600 level, and I only had about 15K left in my stack. And then I'm on the button with Ace-8 offsuit, and I go ahead and rip it all in here, really just trying to take down the blinds and the anti preflop. But unfortunately, the big blind wakes up with Ace-King, and then we don't get there, and it's GG for the tournament for us. Uh, it's been a minute since we've done one of these things from inside an actual casino, but we've headed over to the slot machines, not to play them, but just because their seats are comfortable. But unfortunately, the reason we have to do that is because it's GG for the tournament. I ended up busting out on the sixth level. Definitely not the hottest start to the series, but fortunately it's only about 8.30 p.m. So still plenty of time left in the day. Got to hit up a cash game at the casino. Still not a fan of live tournaments, even though this one was a bit faster. Still pretty uneventful for me, unfortunately, but still plenty of poker to look forward to in this week. Let's get into it. So hopped in the Uber straight back to the Star Casino, got there at about 10 p.m. And fortunately for me, there was already a free seat at the 5-5 game. And the game actually ran all night. So all the following hands are going to be from the 5-5 game. Sometimes it played as a 5-5-10 as well. Definitely had an interesting dynamic and the highest stakes I played on this flock in a while. So let's hop into the game. First hand of the 5-5 was actually a 5-5-10 because the straddle was on and then under the gun opens it up for 30. The action falls to my button with King-10 of hearts and already a pretty interesting decision. If we do want to have a cold calling range, King-10 suited does make sense to put in that range, but as I've discussed on this vlog before, it does make sense to play three body fold, particularly in a cash game that's going to be raked as highly as this one, which was taking a 10% up to 15 cap. In game, I did decide to call. Really didn't want to go against the strong under the gun players range. And I think I would be mixing in a lot of calls here, even with some of the stronger hands in my range. Like I do think at some frequency, I would just flat with ace king and aces. And it's just a good play to mix in, particularly against more competent players in the 5-5. So I threw in the call and then the action gets round to an unknown player in the big blind and they three bet to 135. The under the gun player gets out of the way. Now the action's back on me and a pretty interesting decision with what we want to do here, whether we want to call or fold. Could see going ahead and folding if the opponent's three betting a tight conventional range, which they really should be doing. Under the gun versus big blind, then King-10 suit is going to be pretty dominated. But I do feel like people out of the blinds tend to three bet more than they should when there are cold callers in between just because there's meant to be dead money, which uh, I actually think is a bit of a mistake if you do play like that. If we're against a wider range, we're going to have more equity with King-10 suited, particularly in position, and we have about 100 straddles effective here. So we're getting a pretty good price to see a flop in position. So I do throw in the call. Maybe a bit too loose, maybe folding would be better. Whatever the case, I did call. So we're heads up to a flop of 653 with two hearts. So we do make a flush draw and the opponent goes ahead and C bets 80. Now the action's on me and again, another pretty interesting decision with whether we want to just call or raise. The merits to raising would basically be to fold my opponent off of an ace high hand. I do think this is actually a spot where the opponent's C betting more than they should be. Just intuitively, I feel like they should be having a lot of checks on this board. I'm going to have a lot of over pairs in my range, which have a lot of incentive to to bet so I do think with some of the stronger hands in their range it makes sense for them to play 
check call or check raise even. So the fact that they are having a C-bet range at all kind of makes me think that they're overdoing it and I could attack that by raising. Having said that, calling does make sense as well. If my opponent does have an ace high hand, we're gonna have lots of opportunity to bluff them off on further straights. And additionally, if we do get three bet by like an overpair in this spot, we really are inflating the pot against one of those stronger hands and that can be pretty gross for us. I do decide to just call with the flush draw here, but definitely think there is merit to raising. So we're heads up to the turn, which is the eight of clubs. The opponent checks it over to me now. And in this spot, I absolutely think I have to bluff. I'm gonna very credibly be able to represent a lot of strong pocket pairs like pocket nines, pocket tens, pocket jacks. A few of the sets as well, pocket eights, pocket sixes all make sense. And when my opponent does have ace high, which is like I said on the flop, I do think they are betting too many of their ace high hands in this spot. I think they're just gonna fold those straight away. Here's where I think I make a bit of a mistake in the hand. Don't worry, I didn't check, but I decided to rip it all in as about a two X pot over bet. And uh, I think that's a bit of a mistake. I don't think I'm really gonna do this with any of the hands in my range, except for sets specifically. And maybe that like makes it kind of obvious that I am on a, you know, a strong draw or something like that. And you know, it, it seems counterintuitive. The larger you bet, the more your opponent should fold, right? But I actually think it might level them into calling off with even ace-king or something like that. So yeah, re really dislike my sizing here. I think I could bet something like 200 and probably get the same amount of folds in all honesty. So yeah, a bit of a mistake there. Ripped it all in. And then my opponent is in the tank. And they're in the tank for probably a good 30 seconds or so. And you know, I'm trying to keep my poker face as much as I can. I'm sort of like realizing in my head that I made a mistake by betting so big. But fortunately, the opponent does end up folding their hand and we scoop in this pot. Yeah, I do think the overbet bluff here was pretty spewy, but absolutely stoked we got it through. Next hand is just a straight 5-5, five, five, and I'm under the gun with Ace King of Hearts. I go ahead and raise it up to 15, then a tight passive cutoff throws in the call, and the action's round to a tight aggressive big blind, who three bets it up to 60. The action's on me here, and I do think there is some merit to having a call with some of the Ace Kings in your range here, just because it's gonna be tight early position versus the blinds, but we have Ace Kings suited specifically, which gives us a little bit of extra equity and a little bit extra incentive to four bet, and additionally, I might even four-bet some of the offsuit ace king combinations just to get the cutoff out of there. We really do want to keep our positional advantage. And if we're just flat here, the cutoff's going to call with 100% of their range. And we just kind of want them out there. We want position in this pot. So I go ahead and four-bet it up to 140. The cutoff folds and the big blind calls. So we're heads up with the big blind to a flop of ace eight four with two clubs. The opponent checks it over to me and if there was ever a board and a dynamic to have a range pet on, this is it. Not only are we the pre-flop four better, but it's also an ace I board anyway. I go ahead and make it 70 and then big blind calls pretty quickly. So we're off to the turn, which is the six of spades, putting out backdoor spades. The opponent checks it over to me again. The opponent only has about 490 left in their stack. And so I really do think my options here are either check or go all in. I'm really trying to value target ace queen specifically. So I just want to move it all in and try and win the maximum, which is what I do. I go ahead and shove it for 490. Then my opponent is in the tank and they're in the tank for probably like a minute plus and they just start mumbling to themselves. I can't really really make out what they're saying. I'm just trying to keep my poker face. And then after a while, they end up mucking their hands. Later on after the hand, they told me that they had pocket queens. So pretty good fold by them if they did have queens, although I'm not sure why they're tanking so long on this board. Next hand is just another straight 5-5 five five, and I'm in the cutoff with ace nine offsuit. I raise it up to 15. Then I get a call from an unknown small blind. So we're heads up to a flop of 10-9-4 rainbow. The opponent checks it over to me and I decide to check back. I think small blind cold calling ranges are usually more condensed and pretty strong themselves. I just think with our sort of more middling showdown value hands, we're probably better off just checking and then using them to defend later on than we are betting to deny equity or go for thin value. That's my opinion, so I check it back and then we're off to the turn, which is a repeat 10 of clubs. The opponent checks it over to me and now I think we have a slam dunk value bet spot. This 10 blocks our opponent having a stronger pair. And I think even with hands like pocket sixes, pocket sevens, our opponent is gonna be pretty tempted to call at least one bet. So I go ahead and make it 25 and then the opponent does throw in the call. So we're off to the river, which is the queen of diamonds. The opponent checks it over to me again. Now I think this is an interesting spot, whether we can still keep betting for that really thin value or whether we just need to check and give it up. 
My opponent doesn't really have that many Queen X hands in their range. I think if they had Queen Jack, they would have either led the turn or check raised the turn. So not really that concerned about them having a queen. Maybe ace queen occasionally would just float, but I still think it's much more likely they have a hand like pocket eights, pocket sevens, and I just think they have so many more of those in their range that we're probably better off just betting for value and just hoping they call with one of those hands. So that's what I go ahead and do. I use a bit of a small sizing to price them in. I go ahead and bet 30. Then my opponent's in the tank probably 30 seconds before they go, yeah, all right, I'll keep you honest, which is music to our ears. They do throw in the call. I show my ace nine, and the opponent was actually kind enough to show that they had king nine. So we just outpips them by one, and glad that we did go for the thin value, although I think maybe it was a mistake. My opponent almost did fold, you know, the one pip lower than us. I think if they had, you know, pocket eights or pocket sevens, they're probably definitely getting away from it. So this bet might be negative EV in the long run. This next hand is yet another straight 5-5. Five five. The button goes ahead and open limps. I'm in the small blind to weird king eight of hearts. I go ahead and check it. Somewhere it's a ISO raising here. We do have a pretty strong hand. And if we ever think the button has a potency to limp fold, then I really think it's a good spot to go for it. And maybe checking it is a bit too cautious and I'm really missing AV by not trying to take the pot down preflop. Whatever the case, I did check and the big blind checks as well. Ace four three with two hearts. We flop the nut flush draw and already a pretty interesting decision whether we want to lead out or check it over to the opponents. I think there's a very decent chance that if the button did have an ace-x hand, they'll probably just raise it preflop to try and take it down. So I think they're going to have less strong hands on this board, which actually makes me kind of like bluffing. Having said that, though, you know, bluffing into two people can be a bit dicey, and we do have a lot of showdown value, even with just king high, not to mention our flush draw. So, you know, both options make sense. I decide to check it in this instance. Then the big blind goes ahead and bets 10, the button folds, and again, another interesting decision whether we want to just call or check raise, and I think I much prefer just check calling. Like I said, we do have a bit of showdown value with our king high, but additionally, I think my opponent, you know, I, I said the button likely doesn't have a lot of ace -X hands, but I really do think the big blind's just going to check ace -X hands back, you know, a lot of the offsuit like ace nine, ace six type stuff, I think they're just gonna check it and really don't think we're gonna get that many folds with the check raise in all honesty. So I do decide to just call the 10 and then we're off to a turn, which is the eight of diamonds, which now gives us a pair. Still check it over to the opponent. And then they go ahead and bet 10 again. So the exact same bet they used on the previous street, the action's back on me. And I usually think when people, you know, use the same bet on a previous street, it can be indicative of weakness. And, you know, that kind of makes me want to pounce on the weakness and check raise here to try and buff them off of a weak ace. Having said that though, we're getting such a good price to draw to our flush that I kind of just want to call and then lead out if we do hit our flush, which is what I did in game. I just threw in the call. I'm, I'm a bit concerned. I've been pretty passive this whole hand. We do really want to be using aggressive poker. I think is a bit of a mistake on my behalf, but things change on the river. We hit the king of spades. We do make two pair now. And the action's on me and I really like leading out in this spot. I think my opponent does have a bunch of ace -X hands that they are just gonna absolutely check back on this river. But I think they're gonna call them if I lead out, just because the front door hearts did miss. I decide to go for it, wanna bet big as well, just because I think they will call with a lot of those ace -X hands. So I go ahead and make it 75. Then my opponent sort of rolls their eyes before mucking the cards pretty quickly. So yeah, play, played this hand really passive on the early streets. Maybe I missed a good spot to use some aggression and just take the flop down without seeing a river because we did get there on the river and we couldn't even get a value bet paid off. This next hand is a 5-5-10 and under the gun raises it up for 30. Then I'm in the cutoff with my second favourite hand in all poker, Pocket Kings. I go ahead and 3 bet it up to 90. Then the action folds back around to under the gun and they tank probably like 10 seconds before throwing in the call. So we're heads up to a flop of Queen Jack 4 Rainbow. The opponent checks it over to me and with a hand as strong as Pocket Kings here, I want to bet it up, get a bit of value, build this pot. I go ahead and bet 60. And then my opponent goes ahead and check raises it to 200. Pretty dicey spot for us. We didn't really want to see that. My opponent can definitely have all of the pocket jacks in their range. I think they're going to have a lot of pocket queens as well. Sometimes that hand might four bet pre-flop, but it is an early position versus cutoff dynamic, which is usually pretty tight. And I think they're going to flat with a lot of their queens pre-flop. So I give them credit for queens and jacks and... 
Maybe pocket fours. I mean, I would probably fold that hand in early position, but I do know we're playing live poker and people do get kind of impatient and open hands like that. So do give them a credit for a lot of strong hands, maybe queen jack suited as well. Thing is, if I give them credit for queen jack suited, they could probably have king 10 suited, which is an open-ended straight draw, 10 nine suited, also an open-ended straight draw. And if they do think that I'm C betting overly aggressively, I don't think they could make sense for them to bluff with a hand like Ace 10 suited with backdoor flush or Ace 5 suited with backdoor flush, something like that. So they definitely do have some bluffs in their range. So I can't go ahead and fold yet with a hand as strong as pocket kings. I throw in the call. So we're off to the turn, which is the nine of clubs and the opponent doesn't let up. They go ahead and bet 300. Now I think this spot is really interesting because we do lose to king 10 suited, which was definitely one of their potential bluffs. We do lose to king 10 suited now as well. This nine being out here is kind of bad as well because it blocks our opponent having 10 nine suited. So I do think the amount of bluffs they have in their range has definitely decreased a lot in this turn in particular, but it is somewhat possible if they did check raise with, like I said, ace 10 of clubs or ace five of clubs, those hands are gonna be loving this turn. They turn more equity with their flush draw and they could be barreling off with it. So there is definitely some bluffs in their range and I do want to defend with some of my hands. I'm going to have a lot of sets myself, pocket jacks and pocket queens, but if we're only calling down with those, we could be getting over bluffed if our opponent is choosing to use some of those backdoor flushes as a bluff or maybe even getting super out of line with like ace 10 of hearts or something like that. Could be losing a lot of value by folding our hand here. And I definitely do want to have some defense with over pairs. And I actually think pocket kings without a club is kind of one of the better ones, just because we do block the king 10 suited. We do unblock our opponent having a hand like ace five of clubs, like ace 10 of clubs, which is kind of ideal for us. So I think if we ever were going to defend with an over pair, I think this pocket kings is one of the better ones to do it with. Having said that, wouldn't fold anyone for folding. Our opponent's bluffing range has definitely shrunk here, and they still have all of those strong hands they potentially could have flopped. So wouldn't fold anyone for folding. I didn't do it though. I'm trying to work on not being a folding station. I did throw in the call with my pocket kings. So we're off to a river, which is the six of clubs. Pretty bad river. We do lose to backdoor clubs as well. So when my opponent goes ahead and rips it all in, I just think I absolutely have to fold at this point. And I'm gonna have a bunch of stronger hands I can cool down with. I'm probably gonna have ace king of clubs, ace queen of clubs, as well as I can have pocket queens and pocket jacks myself. And I would rather defend with those hands, particularly when I really think for my opponent to be bluffing here, they would have had to do something completely out of line on an early street with an ace 10 of hearts, with an ace five of hearts, something like that. And I really am just more concerned they did flop a monster or they got there with the backdoor flash or they turned king 10. So I do decide to fold my pocket kings on the river here. So that was it. Those were the most interesting hands I played across the session. Did leave pretty early. It was about 2 a.m. and I was feeling really hungry, like to the point my gameplay was definitely being affected. So I went to the food court to see if there was anything good to eat, but because it was like 2 a.m. on a Friday morning, the only thing they had were like muffins that were probably stale at this point, and I'm like, nah, that's not it. So I went back to my hotel room and had some of the meal prep I cooked the previous day, which I mean, you know, I'm not gonna have the opportunity to play in a 5-5 game when I get back to Melbourne. So maybe I should have just stuck it out in spite of the hunger, but I really wouldn't have been playing my best. So eh, could have seen going either way with the decision, but trust me when I got home and I actually ate, I definitely appreciated the decision. In terms of my gameplay grade on the hands I did play today, I'm gonna give myself a B. I do like that a lot of the decisions I made across the hand. The main mistakes that stick out to me is overbet shoving with king 10 of hearts. Like definitely didn't need to risk that much to try and take the pot down. And if my opponent did call off with ace king, I would have definitely had a lot of egg on my face. It did get through, so I don't want to be too harsh, but yeah, I really didn't need to risk that much to get it through, in my opinion. And the other mistake I made was the king eight suited hand as well. I think I just played it too passive in general and missed a lot of good opportunities to use some aggression and just try and take it down then. So definitely can't go to the A grade level, but lacked a lot of the decisions I made in the other hands. I did defend my range on the turn with the pocket kings, which is something I'm really trying to not be as much of a knit and a folding station and mixing in some defends, but we were able to get away from it on the river when I think it was very, very unlikely. My opponent was bluffing at that point, so pretty happy with how I played that hand and a bunch of the other hands as well. The ace king, the ace nine value bet might have been too thin and probably wouldn't have worked against this opponent specifically. So yeah, definitely can't go to the A grade level, so I'm gonna land on a B for today. As far as live tournaments go for the rest of the series, 
I'm not going to play them. Honestly, I really don't enjoy live tournaments. I'm not even convinced I have that much of an edge when I don't really know what I'm doing relative to the good regs in those games. And I would rather just play cash for the rest of the time in the Gold Coast. These games are good. 2-5 and 5-5 five five are getting up every day. And I really want to sit them while they're good because I probably won't have that much of an opportunity to play games this big when I do get back to Melbourne. So I decided to only play cash for the rest of this trip. And it's a decision I'm pretty happy with. Live tournaments suck and I hate them. <laughs> Might retire from them forever from this point forward. Maybe. I'm not sure. Whatever the case, I hate them. Much prefer cash instead. So I did end up losing 528 of my tournament buy-in. The buy-in was 660, but I sold 20% of the actions. So fortunately, the loss didn't hit me too, too hard. But in terms of the cash game, I brought in for 1,600 and I ended up cashing out for 1,801 leaving me with a decent profit of 201 from the cash games. Still a loser on the day overall, considering those goddamn tournaments. I was happy that my night wasn't entirely ruined. You know, I was, I was in and out within two hours of the tournament. If I had, you know, played five hours and I didn't end up cashing, I definitely would have been much more tilted because I wouldn't have had the chance to grind some of the money back playing cash. And from this point on in the trip, it's on to the next cash game tomorrow. Much more excited to hop into one of those than one of these goddamn tournaments. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for sticking all the way to the end of the vlog. That really helps my channel's analytics. If you haven't already, hop down in the comments below. Let me know what you think of these individual hand histories, how I played them, different strategy stuff. I'm always keen to have a discourse with the people who watch these things. And make sure you subscribe as well. I decided I'm actually going to make four vlogs from my trip out to the Gold Coast. I have enough footage and enough hand histories to do so. So hit subscribe and you'll get those as they come out. But for now, I'm out of here. Peace.